Hello everyone and welcome back to our channel. In today's video, we are going to talk through The Matter With Things, Our Brains, Our Delusions and the Unmaking of the World by Ian McGilchrist. There are three sections, and this is the second part of the summary. The left hemisphere is associated with representation and representation, perceiving things as separate from ourselves and trying to understand them through logical, abstract thinking. The right hemisphere, on the other hand, experiences things as they presence to us, creating a dynamic, two-way relationship with the world. The right hemisphere's way of experiencing truth is as an ongoing process, a constant interaction between thoughts and experiences, while the left hemisphere's understanding of truth is as a fixed, objective thing. Ultimately, the author suggests that truth is a relationship that requires active engagement and attentiveness to experience. Belief, trust, and truth are all interconnected concepts that contribute to a stable society. Trust is a fundamental requirement for a ruler to maintain harmony, and belief involves a relationship based on fidelity and recognition. However, the left hemisphere of the brain tends to view words as tokens that can be manipulated, detached from their historical context. This detachment from language's embeddedness in a human community has led to the rise of post-truth thinking. Various theories of truth have been debated throughout history, including correspondence theory, coherence theory, consensus theory, and deflationist theories. Ultimately, truth is a complex and uncertain concept that is rich with meaning and cannot be easily dismissed or abolished. It is through our lived experiences and relationships that we can approach truth and make sense of the world. The author discusses the influence of William James on Ludwig Wittgenstein's work. Wittgenstein frequently referred to James in his lectures and had principles visible on his bookshelves. However, he clarifies that being pragmatic is not the same as being pragmatist. Pragmatism is an open-minded approach that judges ideas based on their practical results rather than their roots. The left hemisphere tends to stick to its theories even when faced with contrary evidence, while the right hemisphere is more open to change based on experience. The book emphasizes the complementary nature of these two modes of thinking and the need for a balance between them. It also touches on the subject-object divide and the concept of objectivity, arguing that while objectivity is impossible to achieve completely, the pursuit of truth is still essential. The writer suggests that both approaches are necessary, but if one must be abandoned, it should be the left hemisphere's. The author shares their own inclination towards the left hemisphere's approach, as it appeals to the desire for certainty and the ability to persuade others with well-articulated arguments. However, they recognize the limitations of this approach and advocate for a more open-minded and experiential search for truth. The book also discusses an experiment that demonstrates how the left hemisphere can hold on to false beliefs, disregarding contradictory evidence in favor of internal coherence. The left hemisphere sees truth as something fixed and independent, while the right hemisphere sees truth as a process that arises through experience and interaction with the world. The author argues that both perspectives are necessary for a proper understanding of truth, and that the dominant view in society today, which leans towards either naive positivism or naive deconstructionism, is limited and lacking in subtlety. The author also discusses the role of science in our search for truth, acknowledging its value but also highlighting its limitations. Science, while successful in explaining and manipulating the world, is still based on metaphor and models, which can lead to limited perspectives and distorted views of reality. The author suggests that a more balanced approach, taking into account the contributions of both hemispheres, is needed for a more comprehensive understanding of truth. Objectivity is seen as someone's position, situated somewhere and making assumptions. Science cannot remove the human mind from the process of understanding and that all scientific knowledge is inherently human knowledge. The limitations of our senses and our cognitive abilities also restrict our perception of reality. While objectivity in the sense of considering multiple viewpoints is important, it is impossible to achieve a viewpoint that makes no presuppositions. Science must acknowledge its inherent subjectivity while striving for a fair consideration of all possibilities. McGilchrist discusses the nature of belief and the role of value in science. He argues that beliefs are not arbitrary but guided by tacit awareness. He suggests that science often overlooks values and places too much emphasis on precision and measurement. 
Some important phenomena, such as those that are difficult to quantify or fluctuate in their manifestations, are often ignored. McGilchrist also explores the notion of objectivity in science, emphasizing that it lies not in propositions but in a disciplined disposition. It highlights the limitations and hidden assumptions of science, including the assumption of a comprehensible universe and the belief in cause and effect mechanisms. The author concludes that science relies on faith and assumptions, but it should strive to minimize these and acknowledge their presence. He also argues against the myth of the scientific method, which portrays science as a rigid, impersonal process devoid of imagination and inspiration. He suggests that this myth fails to capture the true nature of scientific inquiry, which involves creativity, intuition, and the generation of hypotheses through imagination. The writer highlights the role of imagination in science, citing examples of scientists making discoveries through intuition and inspiration rather than strict logic and formal proofs. Science is a human endeavor that relies on interpretation and subjective judgments, and that the practice of science is inherently uncertain and open to new discoveries. He also criticizes the idea that science is solely rooted in objective evidence, noting that theories in physics, for example, often lack experimental support. The author discusses the limitations and assumptions of science, particularly in the fields of string theory and quantum mechanics. He emphasizes that science is not objective but rather subjective and contingent, and that it is always provisional and uncertain. He argues that science cannot investigate certain aspects of human experience and that it cannot answer questions about the nature, meaning, and purpose of life. McGilchrist also highlights the problem of reductionism in biology and the persistent adherence to a mechanistic view of life. He calls for a more balanced approach to science, one that incorporates both the left and right hemispheres of the brain. He discusses the language used by biologists to describe living organisms and the dissonance between this language and the metaphor of the machine. Six features of this language that stand out in biology are actively coordinated processes, wholeness, values, meaning, purpose, and self-realization. These features are not applicable to machines but are used to describe organisms. The author argues that biologists use language that suggests perception, knowledge, response, and communication because organisms exhibit these qualities. The author criticizes the machine model often used to describe biology and emphasizes the limitations of the genetic program model. He argues that genes do not solely determine the development of an organism and that heredity is more complex than just genetics. He also highlights the complexity of the genome and the unknown aspects of gene function. Organisms cannot be understood as machines and there are several reasons why this is the case. Firstly, organisms are constantly in motion and cannot be switched off like machines. Secondly, the stability of an organism is maintained through constant change, whereas machines return to equilibrium when switched off. Organisms are dynamic flows of matter and energy, rather than static structures. The development of an organism is a continuous process that cannot be fully explained by a genetic program or deterministic steps. Furthermore, the writer highlights the complex interactions between genes, environment, and other organisms that shape an organism's development. Organisms are characterized by their continuous flow of matter and energy, and their existence is dependent on this ongoing process. McGilchrist discusses the scale at which change occurs in living organisms, he explains that there are approximately 37.2 trillion cells in the human body, and each cell performs millions of complex reactions per second. These reactions occur within a complex network and are facilitated by enzymes that promote rapid change. He also highlights the collaborative nature of biological processes, describing it as a table around which decision-makers debate and respond collectively to information. Stability in living organisms relies on constant energetic exchange with the surroundings and the maintenance of a balanced import and export of materials. The author challenges the notion of linear causation in biological systems, arguing that causation in organisms follows spirals and involves recursive loops and multiple causes with multiple effects. It concludes by asserting that organisms are flows rather than chains, functioning dynamically and adaptively. According to microbiologist Brian Ford, living cells possess a level of intelligence that is not recognized by science. 
The processes of cognition, response, and decision-making in cells go beyond conventional modeling and are not amenable to computer analysis. Furthermore, biological systems are non-linear and cannot be effectively modeled digitally. In organisms, there is never just one-way action, but rather interaction and mutual construction between the organism and its environment. Organisms actively reconstruct their genomes in response to their conditions, and genetic change is not solely due to accidents or damage to DNA. DNA is a standing resource on which the cell can draw for survival and reproduction, and it is embedded in a complex system of interacting resources. The environment affects the organism, which in turn restructures the cell and makes use of DNA accordingly. The parts of organisms are continually changing and responding to their context, resulting in different outcomes even with the same genetic instructions. Ultimately, genes do not act independently, but are influenced by their environment and the larger system in which they exist. Genes in organisms are constantly evolving and changing in response to their environment. They can adopt new functions, fuse with other genes, or even disappear altogether. This flexibility is due to the malleability of genes, which serve the needs of the organism they are in. Changes in gene conformation can affect gene expression, while changes in the genetic code itself can occur. Organisms actively modify their DNA through cutting, copying, and fixing processes. This process of genetic engineering allows cells to adapt to new conditions and is not a one-sided relationship where genes dictate their own preservation. Cells also have elaborate mechanisms to edit and correct DNA, including mutations, rearrangements, and duplications. Living organisms are dynamic processes that can adapt and balance on the edge of chaos. The writer highlights the regenerative capabilities of flatworms, which can regenerate a new body after being cut into pieces, and retain their memories even after decapitation. He also discusses the flexibility of tadpoles in adjusting their development to reach their ultimate goal of becoming adult frogs. Organisms are not simply driven by predetermined blueprints, but rather exhibit ingenuity and resourcefulness when faced with challenges. The discoveries of Barbara McClintock, which showed that the genome is not a static entity and can respond to unanticipated challenges. Organisms possess a level of intelligence and decision-making that goes beyond conventional mechanistic explanations. Cells and organisms are cognitive entities that act purposefully to ensure survival, growth, and proliferation. Evolution is described as an intelligent process driven by cognitive networks and cellular functions of self-modification, rather than gradual selection of random changes. McGilchrist also emphasizes the collaborative nature of life, with cells and organisms co-operating and sharing information. He challenges the notion of clearly defined boundaries and emphasizes the interconnectedness and interdependence of organisms. The machine model is criticized for its simplicity and failure to capture the complexity and dynamic nature of living organisms. While the machine model may be useful in some contexts, it is not an accurate representation of biological systems. McGilchrist also explores the relationship between science and the concept of purpose. While physics tends to focus on the how of phenomena, biology faces the additional question of what for. The purpose of living beings and their intrinsic goals is often dismissed or overlooked in scientific inquiry. However, denying teleology in biology leads to vacuity and meaningless explanations. The author argues that purpose does not imply deterministic plans, but rather a tendency or inclination that is woven into the fabric of life. Exploring purpose requires a shift in perception, recognizing the importance of processes and wholes rather than just parts. Accepting purpose in biology does not eliminate the need for scientific inquiry, but rather enriches it by allowing for deeper understanding and exploration. McGilchrist's book argues that form in living creatures implies purpose and direction of intent. Repair and correction in organisms suggest an inclination towards a specific form or goal. This purpose is intrinsic and fulfilled within the unfolding process of life. While mutations are traditionally thought to be random, Recent discoveries of de novo evolution challenge this idea. Organisms exhibit patterned and purposeful behavior despite random events, and highlights the complexity of cellular behavior and decision-making. The concept of purpose clashes with the machine model of biology, 
which fails to account for the innate intentionality and intelligent behavior displayed by individual cells and organisms. An explanation based on attractive formal patterns or fields may better capture the complexity and purposefulness in living systems. McGilchrist argues against the idea that complex structures in nature can arise naturally without a will or intention behind them. While it acknowledges the concept of self-organization, he questions whether it provides a satisfactory explanation. The living world cannot be explained as a machine with external purpose, but rather as a phenomenon full of purpose and intentionality. He criticizes the machine model by pointing out that it distorts our understanding of organisms and fails to account for their complexity. Instead, the author suggests viewing nature as a process of flow and interconnectedness, where entities are not static things but constantly changing and evolving. Science always deals with processes and should focus on patterns and interconnectedness rather than rigid entities. McGilchrist argues that stasis is an illusion and that scale and quantity have significant impacts on quality. He emphasizes that the left hemisphere and right hemisphere have different views on space and time, with the left hemisphere focusing on freezing objects in time and the right hemisphere appreciating the flow and depth of time. He also highlights that discrete units can be seen as interconnected waves when viewed along their length. He suggests that the machine model of viewing organisms as machines is limiting and damaging, and that the language used in scientific research, which often uses machine-related terminology, needs to be reconsidered. The author argues for a shift in perspective that recognizes the cooperative nature of life, rather than just focusing on competition. Living beings are autonomous entities, but their function as a whole involves collaboration with other organisms. Collaboration includes a combination of competition and cooperation, with the forces for division balanced by those for union. Collaboration requires differences in types, strengths, and roles, and every society contains elements of both difference and sameness. The author also explores how molecular replication is the achievement of ensembles of molecules rather than individual molecules. He highlights the importance of collaboration in evolution, leading to greater harmony and empathy. The author discusses the importance of maintaining a broad, creative approach to science, rather than becoming narrowly focused and utilitarian. He highlights the dangers of reducing science to technical problem-solving within existing theories and emphasizes the need for general ideas and hypotheses in scientific progress. McGilchrist also touches on the fragmentation of scientific disciplines and the increasing inaccessibility of scientific research to non-specialists. He addresses the shift towards mechanistic thinking in neuroscience and the need to recognize the brain as part of a person, rather than just a machine. Scientists cannot avoid philosophical considerations and should not impose a naive form of materialism on philosophical discussions. Additionally, the author briefly mentions concerns about the reliability of neuroimaging research and the issue of false positive results. Functional imaging has limitations and uncertainties in studying the brain. While structural imaging of the brain is reliable, functional imaging is fraught with difficulties. Functional imaging does not provide a complete picture of brain function and should be used in conjunction with other sources of information. Interpretation of functional imaging data is uncertain due to factors such as experimental conditions, variations in task presentation, and the inherent complexity of the brain's functioning. The author also mentions the issue of reproducibility in scientific research, stating that many studies lack statistical power and are not easily reproducible. The limitations and challenges in neuroscience research emphasize the need for a combination of approaches, including lesion studies, to gain a more comprehensive understanding of the brain. The author discusses the problems and biases in scientific research and publication. He highlights how the pressure to publish in prestigious journals can lead to the dissemination of invalid or misleading data. The pursuit of positive results and the publishing of negative results only when contradicted by other teams can lead to a proteus phenomenon, where extreme claims and refutations rapidly alternate. Financial and non-financial conflicts of interest can further distort research findings. The impact factor, a measure used to rank journals, is criticized for its potential to corrupt the publication process. The pressure to produce papers often results in the citation of papers without actually reading and verifying the content. These issues undermine scientific integrity and hinder the advancement of knowledge.
The author discusses instances of personal attacks within academia and the inclusion of irrelevant criteria in evaluating journal quality. He also mentions cases of fraudulent papers being accepted and published, as well as instances of plagiarism. The author argues that peer review is subjective and inconsistent, and that reviewers often only agree by chance. Furthermore, he raises concerns about bias and the stifling of innovation in scientific research. Overall, he questions the integrity and effectiveness of the peer review system in ensuring the quality and reliability of scientific publications. He provides examples of how prestigious papers from renowned institutions were rejected when resubmitted with fictional author names and affiliations. The study found that only a small number of editors and reviewers were able to detect the resubmissions, highlighting the flaws in the system. McGilchrist also mentions how funding for research is often biased towards researchers from prestigious universities, limiting opportunities for individuals from low-status institutions. The authors of the study faced negative consequences and backlash for their findings, demonstrating the resistance to change within the scientific community. McGilchrist suggests that peer review is open to fraud and manipulation, and calls for a more efficient and transparent alternative. He also briefly touches on the issues with public health advice and the influence of financial interests in scientific research. The pursuit of large research grants and the need to show the value and outcome of research ahead of time hinders originality, imagination, and serendipity. Small teams are more effective in exploring and amplifying promising ideas from older and less popular work. The author also highlights the negative impact of measuring the quantity and quality of research, as it leads to conformity, mediocrity, and a focus on publications over true understanding. Furthermore, he discusses the resistance to new ideas and the suppression of important information that doesn't fit the prevailing theories. The current scientific system is resistant to imaginative insights and lacks true progress. The writer explores the limitations and biases that can hinder scientific progress and the pursuit of truth. He notes that scientists' adherence to preconceived beliefs can prevent them from accepting new discoveries that challenge their existing theories. The fear of stepping out of line and expressing unconventional views also creates a stifling environment within the scientific community. The book introduces the case of Dr. Gunter Betchley, a respected paleontologist who lost his position after publicly expressing support for intelligent design. It argues for a more open-minded and inclusive scientific establishment that welcomes different perspectives and engages in fair and objective evaluation of ideas. McGilchrist advocates for a balanced approach in science, with both left and right hemisphere thinking contributing to the advancement of knowledge. He explores the issue of dependability in science research and highlights the importance of drawing on a wide range of evidence to ensure the reliability of findings. Assumptions should be based on studies of different types, employing multiple approaches, and should take into account findings from different eras and in different species. The author also discusses the need for coherence and integration in scientific hypotheses, as well as the provisional nature of scientific knowledge. He emphasizes the value of reason and science in understanding the world but cautions against the limitations of these approaches. He argues for a balanced perspective that recognizes the role of other ways of knowing, such as intuition, emotion, and imagination, in gaining a deeper understanding of truth. McGilchrist's book explores the limitations and value of reason and rationality. What we know and perceive is only a partial glimpse of reality, highlighting the importance of individual perspectives and experiences. He emphasizes the intersubjective nature of human consciousness and suggests that a balanced understanding of the world requires engaging with different points of view. Reasoning is described as a consistency tool rather than a means to achieve complete understanding. He cautions against blindly following logic and emphasizes the role of intuition in evaluating reason. Reason and rationality should be seen as servants, not masters, and that they should be grounded in and guided by intuition and experience. He also discusses the limits and achievements of science and mathematics, stating that they are not solely driven by reasoning. Philosophy relies on having a vision, rather than just engaging in endless logical arguments. Philosophers need the courage to stand by their own visions, instead of merely criticizing others. Arguments and logical reasoning come second to having a fresh perspective and new insights. However, philosophy has become too focused on technicalities and argumentation, 
losing sight of the importance of insights. Reasoning alone is insufficient because it lacks a connection to the whole person and the context of history and experience. Philosophy, like science, has become too specialized and obscure, neglecting to engage with pressing societal problems. The vision of the left hemisphere, with its narrow focus, limits our understanding and prevents a broader perspective. Philosophers should constantly search for the truth, rather than attempting to professionalize wisdom through technicalities. The author discusses the limitations of philosophy and the role of reason in understanding the world. TTHE traditional view of philosophy as a discipline concerned with large visions and the human situation has been replaced by a focus on analysis and intellectualizing. This shift has resulted in a fragmentation of vision and an inability to understand the general character of human culture. He emphasizes the importance of philosophical synthesis, which involves linking different elements together, rather than solely relying on analysis. He also explores the relationship between explicit and implicit reason, highlighting the limitations of explicit reasoning and the need for a balance between the two. The right hemisphere is more involved in the living process, while the left hemisphere focuses on post-mortem analysis. The representation of reason through retrospective analysis is limited and only gives a partial account of the true reasoning process. The relationship between reason and the representation of it is like that between a portrait and the person it portrays, as there are limitations in capturing the true essence. In moral inquiries, the reasons given are merely symbols and samples of the real grounds. Analyzing reason excessively can have negative effects, such as weakening actions, stimulating controversy, and substituting instinctive feelings with rigid rules. However, caution should be exercised in explicitly rational processes, as they are essential and should not be abandoned. The limits of reason need to be recognized, as expecting reason to uncover everything is irrational. Abstraction and embodiment are key aspects of reason, and while abstraction through linguistic thought and categorization can be helpful, they should not be mistaken for reality. Reason should not be abandoned but used with discernment, recognizing its limitations and the need for embodied experience. The left hemisphere's dominance in rationality should ultimately serve the broader perspective of the right hemisphere. McGilchrist discusses the issue of abstraction in human thinking and how it can distort our understanding of reality. He points out that abstract concepts can be valuable and necessary in certain contexts, but caution should be exercised in their use. The philosopher William James and others have criticized the tendency to prioritize abstract thinking over the experience of the phenomenal world. The left hemisphere of the brain, associated with abstract thinking, can lead to a disconnect from the embodied, contextual nature of human perception. The author emphasizes the importance of grounding our thinking in embodied experience and recognizing the limits of abstraction. He also highlights the flaws in certain economic theories that rely too heavily on rational abstraction, neglecting the complexity and richness of human behavior. It is a call for a more balanced and holistic approach to understanding reality. Abstraction is a process of simplifying complex problems, but judgment and experience are required to determine which simplification is appropriate. The author also criticizes the use of abstract models in decision-making, stating that they often divorce objectives from their real-world context. Additionally, he challenges the repugnant conclusion, a moral philosophy argument, and argues that it is flawed in its approach to happiness and the concept of existence. Philosophical thinking and the pursuit of precision can limit understanding and overlook the complexities of reality, and advocates for a more contextual and intuitive approach to moral thought. He explores the role of ambiguity and flexibility in human understanding, and argues that the less rigidly words are defined, the more connections they can make with other concepts and ideas. The right hemisphere of the brain is crucial in understanding implicit meanings, non-literal language, and gaining insight into a whole. Precision and categorization, often favored by the left hemisphere, can be limiting and overlook the importance of context and uniqueness. McGilchrist emphasizes the value of ambiguity and the need to balance clarity with openness to complexities and contradictions. He suggests that wisdom lies in embracing uncertainties and mysteries, allowing room for the implicit and the unexplainable. Language is inherently imprecise, with poetry being the only exception that relies on ambiguity. Some individuals believe that only when something is expressed in words can it be precise, 
but language can never fully capture the complexity and richness of direct experience. Precise language can often convey less information and be less helpful than broader, vague terms. Precision can be burdensome and exhaustive, leading to a loss of common sense and flexibility. Laws also need to strike a balance between precision and vagueness to be effective. Calculation and measurement, while useful in many areas, often lead to an artificial sense of precision that does not reflect the true complexity of human variables. The imposition of standardized measurements in art, for example, can stifle creativity and reduce artistic quality to a statistic. Ultimately, judgment and flexibility should prevail over rigid metrics. Any conclusion reached through reason can only be truly rational through the use of calculation. This belief involves converting imprecise qualities into precise quantities, which is the basis for calculation. However, this view has led to negative consequences. Numbers themselves have qualities, and in the right hemispheric mode, they are seen as dynamic relations. Quantity also affects quality, as more of a good thing does not necessarily make it better. Additionally, many human qualities are not quantifiable and cannot be reduced to calculations. The drive to quantification ignores the complexities and intricacies of human life and reduces moral judgments to mere calculations. Moral decisions are often based on unconscious and intuitive judgments derived from experience and emotional sensitivity to others. The author discusses the concept of reason and rationality, arguing that rationality is not limited to the narrow concept of precision, calculation, and deduction associated with the left hemisphere of the brain. Weisman, the author of this argument, explains that rationality can also involve insight and judgment, which are not obtained through deduction. A philosopher can reach important truths that cannot be demonstrated through formal proof, yet their arguments can still be rational. The author also explores the limitations of linearity in reasoning and the importance of understanding the whole human picture rather than focusing solely on linear causation. Additionally, he mentions that some goals, such as happiness, cannot be pursued directly, and that success in business often comes as a byproduct of running a good business. He highlights the complexity and incommensurability of goals, as well as the importance of non-technical knowledge and the byproducts of a well-lived life. McGilchrist discusses the limitations of linear thinking and the need for a more holistic, intuitive approach to understanding. He emphasizes the importance of immediate apprehension and gestalt recognition in gaining certain insights. Linear thinking may not lead to deep understanding and can prevent us from reaching higher levels of insight. He also highlights the paradoxical nature of knowledge and the need for multiple levels of thinking. He mentions the role of paradox in oriental wisdom traditions and the idea that true knowledge cannot be acquired through reasoning alone. The distinction between algebraic and topological thinking in mathematics and the value of intuition in problem solving is also discussed. The author explores the role of personal elements in philosophy and the tendency for certain philosophical styles to be associated with specific psychological conditions. He argues that philosophy is not purely a matter of impersonal reason but is intertwined with the temperament, character, and history of the philosopher. He highlights the influence of the left hemisphere, which emphasizes logic and sequential thinking, in shaping educational systems and limiting creativity. He also suggests that the Western culture's bias towards language and naming may contribute to a preference for sequential digital thinking. Furthermore, the author discusses the connection between philosophy and psychology, with philosophers often grappling with personal biases and insecurities in their work, suggesting that a more holistic and inclusive approach to philosophy is necessary. He also discusses the connection between philosophy and mental health, specifically focusing on schizophrenia and autism. The author argues that there is a link between the schizo-autistic features of individuals and their tendency towards left hemisphere thinking. He also explores the impact of philosophy on mental well-being, suggesting that spending a life in abstract reasoning may be damaging to a person's character. McGilchrist shares personal experiences and observations to support these claims, and discusses the nature of truth and the pitfalls of literalism, emphasizing the importance of metaphor in expressing truth. He reflects on a conversation with their father about the opera Don Giovanni and the nature of truth. The father dismisses the opera as ridiculous because the wounded character should not be able to sing due to his injury. 
This leads to a discussion about the role of myths and the arts in conveying truth. Myths are not meant to be taken literally, but rather express truths that cannot be conveyed through ordinary language. The author traces the history of the word myth and explores the limitations of logic and facts in capturing the complexity of human experience. He suggests that both logos, reason, and mythos, myth, are important in understanding the world, but there needs to be a balance between the two. The importance of mythos, metaphorical and contextual knowledge, in contrast to logos, literal and decontextualized knowledge. Poetry, music, and myth all contribute to our understanding of reality, offering insights that cannot be captured by propositional discourse. Language itself is limited in its ability to approach ultimate reality, and that philosophical discourse should have the quality of poetry. McGilchrist also explore the role of art and myth in allowing us to connect with aspects of reality beyond words. He suggests that metaphor is fundamental to all understanding and that eliminating metaphor would eliminate philosophy altogether. He discusses the role of conceptual metaphor and metaphorical language in abstract human thought, particularly in science and spiritual insight. Words can often betray true knowledge and direct experience that cannot be adequately communicated in language. The connotative aspects of language and metaphor help us connect with the world as the right hemisphere experiences it bridging the gap between language and the world. The author also highlights the importance of mythos in understanding the world and living a fully human life. Mythos, embodied in art, religion, and metaphor, allows us to see abstract truths more clearly and provides a deeper understanding of the world than scientific explanations alone. The author uses the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice as an example, highlighting how myths offer a concrete experience of abstract truths. Myths, like the Orpheus myth, provide a glimpse of elusive realities and the dangers of explicitness and explicit reasoning. McGilchrist goes on to discuss logical paradoxes and how they arise from the left hemisphere's analytical approach, which clashes with the right hemisphere's intuitive understanding. Paradoxes often involve conflicting views that each have a claim on truth, but not all truths are equal. The writer concludes paradoxes that arise from the left hemisphere's pursuit of precision and its failure to understand contextual factors. The philosopher Paul Weiss argues that situations should be understood as a whole, rather than analyzed step by step. He introduces the idea that uncertainty exists from the moment an announcement is made, and that preparedness must be maintained every day. This challenges the left hemisphere's desire for precision and unambiguous understanding. McGilchrist's book mentions paradoxes of motion and time, including Zeno's dichotomy and Achilles and the tortoise. These paradoxes demonstrate the limitations of left hemisphere thinking and the importance of the right hemisphere's intuitive understanding of the flow of time and movement. He emphasizes the need to view the world as it happens, rather than through a retrospective, fragmented analysis. Zeno's paradoxes and McTaggart's paradox raise questions about the nature of time. Zeno argues that when time is represented spatially, it becomes problematic and paradoxical. Similarly, McTaggart suggests that time cannot exist because it is self-contradictory. The Sarites paradox, the dollar-cost auction, and the paradox of entailment are examples of paradoxes that arise when precise boundaries and logical steps are imposed on inherently imprecise and evolving concepts. These paradoxes highlight the left hemisphere's preference for certainty and discrete elements. The third man paradox and Bradley's paradox of relations demonstrate the left hemisphere's difficulty in connecting discrete elements and the need for continuity and leaps. There is also a tendency to reify representations, leading to paradoxes of place and identity, such as the morning star paradox. The author explores various paradoxes and their relationship with the functioning of the left and right hemispheres of the brain. He provided examples such as the paradox of negation and the paradox of self-deception, emphasizing how the left hemisphere tends to conflate language and reality, while the right hemisphere understands the complexities of human nature and the limits of language. He also examines paradoxes involving self-reference, such as Epimenides' paradox and Grelling's paradox, highlighting the nuanced understanding of meaning and context provided by the right hemisphere. Overall suggesting that an understanding of the hemispheric differences can shed light on the nature of paradoxes. Language takes on a different reality in the left hemisphere of the brain, where it becomes untethered from reality and highly self-referential. 
This is reflected in the work of artist Magritte, who plays with levels of reference and the relationship between presence and representation. Self-reference can lead to paradoxes, like Russell's Barber paradox and the Ship of Theseus paradox. The left hemisphere mindset, guided by machine thinking, expects a complete, closed system, but this is impossible due to the inherent incompleteness of logic. The right hemisphere, on the other hand, sees the whole and understands that things change and evolve. Time travel and future knowledge paradoxes arise from spatializing time, which encourages retrospection and projection. Infinity paradoxes, such as Thomson's lamp, defy resolution and highlight the inherent impossibility of certain tasks. McGilchrist explores the role of intuition in our understanding of truth. He challenges the perception that intuition is primitive and unreliable, arguing that it is actually a valuable and accurate way of making decisions. Intuition is often misunderstood and undervalued in contemporary culture, favoring science and reason over intuition and imagination. He provides examples of how intuition can be remarkably accurate, such as in the case of quickly forming impressions of people or making gut feelings that turn out to be correct. The author argues that intuition should be celebrated and trusted, as it can process vast amounts of information and make complex judgments more effectively than conscious deliberation. McGilchrist concludes with a story of a racehorse trainer who relies on his intuition to predict race outcomes. Frank, a successful horse racing tipster, who noticed that the more pressure he felt to come up with accurate predictions, the worse he performed. Despite his success, Frank struggled with self-doubt and a lack of confidence in his own abilities. He and his wife, Cappy, recognized the importance of shutting off the logical, left brain thinking and tapping into their intuition. Frank's success as a tipster was based on subtle observations and feelings about the horses, rather than concrete facts and information. Additionally, Frank found that certain factors, such as having his son accompany him to races, negatively impacted his performance. The story highlights the value of intuition and instincts in decision-making, challenging the dominant belief in Western society that favors logic and reason over intuitive knowing. Human instincts are passed down through generations. A study that suggests trauma experienced by Holocaust survivors may have been inherited by their children, leading to epigenetic changes and an increased likelihood of stress disorders. Research on animals that shows induced fears can be inherited by subsequent generations. McGilchrist raises the question of how patterns of behavior and thought are transmitted without being taught, and suggests that there may be a collective memory or morphic resonance that allows for this inheritance. He also explores the idea of archetypes and their connection to instincts, highlighting how they can be experienced as both unique and universal. The significance of intuition and consciousness in driving behavior is also discussed, along with examples from motorcycle racing that demonstrate the impact of conscious will on performance. On conscious and unconscious decision-making processes, McGilchrist emphasizes the importance of attending to the overall feel or shape of a situation, rather than focusing solely on specific details. Conscious deliberation can sometimes be detrimental to decision-making, as it interrupts the intuitive processes that experts rely on. Phenomenon of choking, where people perform worse on tasks when the stakes are higher. External reinforcement and conscious self-awareness can interfere with our ability to make accurate judgments. McGilchrist highlights the fluidity of consciousness and the need to avoid narrow attention in order to make better decisions. The unconscious mind takes into account a large amount of information quickly, unlike the conscious mind which can only focus on a few salient details. The author criticizes Malcolm Gladwell's concept of thin slicing and argues that the unconscious mind is capable of dealing with complex patterns. The book also explores examples of experts relying on intuition, such as art historians identifying forgeries and chess grandmasters making quick and accurate moves based on pattern recognition. It emphasizes the importance of embodied cognition and the interaction between the conscious and unconscious minds in decision-making. It discusses the capacity of the unconscious mind for recognition memory and its ability to process information quickly. The author discusses the concept of knowing without knowing you know and provides examples of this phenomenon. One example is the ability to have an emotional reaction to a fearful face even if it is shown for a very short amount of time and followed by a neutral face. Another example is blindsight, 
where individuals who are blind in the traditional sense can still navigate obstacles and react to stimuli even though they claim to not see anything. The author argues that intuition is more reliable and quicker than explicit reasoning, and it takes into account many factors that may not be consciously recognized. Intuition is seen as the foundation of expertise in various fields, such as medicine and nursing. The author also criticizes the belief that truth can only be approached by eliminating the human element, including intuition, emphasizing that this belief is irrational. Intuition is not infallible, but it should not be dismissed, as it can lead to valuable insights and decision-making. Intuition is a form of knowledge that is informed by experience and is necessary for making quick decisions in a complex world. They dismiss the idea that machines or rational reasoning can produce unbiased outcomes, as biases are inherent in human nature and are present even in the data that machines learn from. The author also emphasizes the importance of being aware of our prejudices and continuously examining them, rather than trying to eliminate them completely. Prejudices are a fundamental part of human knowledge and should not be dismissed as irrational or unreliable. The writer arguing that while prejudice is often a derogatory term, it is a natural product of our experiences and necessary for our functioning as human beings. Prejudice can be based on ignorance or experience, but it becomes harmful when it is not commensurate with that experience or when it substitutes the category for the individual. Biases can exist even in intelligent individuals and that education does not necessarily reduce bias. Furthermore, McGilchrist's book explores how stereotypes can often be accurate, contrary to popular belief, and that our perception of individual cases is not heavily influenced by stereotypes. He emphasizes the need to recognize our own prejudices and biases in order to make fair judgments. The author highlights a report that found that all white juries in Britain are not more likely to convict black defendants, but rather all juries, both black and white, are more likely to convict white defendants. He also suggests that our capacity to judge character from faces is based on experience and can be quite accurate, even if the effect is not very strong. McGilchrist explores the role of intuition and reason in decision-making, noting that reasoning often leads to poor decisions and that intuition is often dismissed and denigrated. He emphasizes the importance of balancing reason and intuition in order to gain a fuller understanding of reality. The author discusses the issue of inconsistency in expert judgments and challenges the notion that experts are always reliable and consistent in their assessments. He questions the validity of studies cited by Kahneman that suggest experts contradict themselves a certain percentage of the time, and argues that these studies were based on flawed assumptions and did not accurately reflect the true nature of expert judgment. Furthermore, expertise involves more than just making predictions, and that experts often rely on intuition and holistic understanding of a situation. He also mentions the role of heuristics and cognitive biases in influencing decision-making, the author argues that these biases are failures of the reasoning process itself, rather than emotional or global failures. In many situations, people make quick and dirty decisions that are inferior to what they would make if they thought more carefully and took their time. The book presents a two-system model of decision-making, with System 1 being quick and unreliable, and System 2 being slower and more reliable. The author also discusses logical mistakes and the importance of heuristics in uncertain situations. He argues that heuristics are adaptive and that complex problems do not always require complex solutions, and highlights the importance of context and experience in shaping our understanding of the world. While heuristics and intuitions can sometimes lead to cognitive errors or biases, they are also essential for human functioning and should not be negated. McGilchrist's book challenges the notion that all occasions of human error are proof of our fallibility as compared to machines, arguing that our ability to blend logical reasoning with emotional and social intelligence sets us apart. It also suggests that beliefs and intuitions are not necessarily opposed to reasoning, but can complement it, leading to a more holistic form of rationality. Intuition is a valuable tool that can provide insights and knowledge that traditional analytical reasoning may not uncover. The author also highlights the dangers and limitations of relying solely on rationality and measurement, as it can lead to a narrow and incomplete understanding of complex issues. He suggests that a balance between intuition and analysis is necessary for optimal decision-making. Additionally, 
He emphasizes the value of common sense in daily life and the detrimental effects when it is lost, as seen in conditions like schizophrenia. The overlap between schizophrenia and obsessive-compulsive disorder lies in the love of routine, intolerance of ambiguity, and the need for certainty. Schizophrenic individuals detach themselves from the living world and crave abstract knowledge. In schizophrenia, the focus shifts, and individuals struggle to see the deeper and broader meaning of things. They may jump to conclusions or believe that the world consists of senseless fragments. Schizophrenia involves a loss of intuitive understanding and the ability to navigate everyday situations. Intuition is the tacit possession of basic understanding and a necessary prerequisite for daily tasks. Schizophrenic individuals also lack common sense, which allows others to create connections and enter a realm where everything functions naturally and obviously. The attempt to substitute rules for tacit knowledge is futile and indicative of psychopathology. The culture's over-reliance on computation and analysis causes a barbaric simplification and ignorance of what is beyond calculation. Intuition, imagination, and intuitive insight are crucial for accessing truth and understanding the world. Einstein believed that scientific and mathematical discovery involved intuition and the use of shapes and metaphors as tools for understanding. He saw beauty as an essential component of these discoveries, as it guided the search for logical and harmonious explanations. This idea of beauty as a test of correctness was shared by many mathematicians and scientists. Insight, whether in mathematics or poetry, involves perceiving similarities in dissimilar things, and often comes suddenly and convincingly. Intuitive insights are fallible, but they may be less so than other forms of understanding, as evidenced by studies showing that insight-based solutions are more often correct than analytically derived solutions. The process of insight involves a new gestalt, a holistic perception of patterns and connections. It is a creative process and is deeply intertwined with our sense of beauty. McGilchrist explores the relationship between language, sleep, and insight. He argues that language is not necessary for thought and can sometimes hinder mental processes. He illustrates this with examples of individuals who think in pictures rather than words and notes that visual thinking is more important for problem solving than verbal thinking. Sleep promotes creative problem solving and the generation of new ideas. During REM sleep, the logical mind retires and the body engages with emotions and intuition, creating ideal conditions for intuitive problem solving. Imagination is often overlooked in favor of the more acceptable term of creativity. Imagination is seen as necessary for accessing truth and creating new experiences. It is distinct from fantasy in that it offers glimpses of something partially known but not fully understood. Imagination contributes to the creation of the world we experience in two ways, through everyday perception that is influenced by past experiences and preconceptions, and through moments of authentic and unique perception that bring something entirely new into being. Coleridge's distinction between fantasy and imagination is explored, with imagination seen as a transformative and integrative force. The author refers to the distinction made by Coleridge between primary and secondary imagination. Primary imagination refers to the creative force that is inherent in the world itself, while secondary imagination is the creative force within the minds of human beings. Primary imagination is linked to the right hemisphere of the brain, allows us to perceive the world in a holistic and intuitive way, while secondary imagination, associated with the left hemisphere, is analytical and rational. A synthesis of both imagination and reason is necessary for a deeper understanding of reality. The writer emphasizes the importance of embracing uncertainty and not relying solely on clarity and definiteness in our understanding of the world. He explores the relationship between our experience and reality and how the hemispheres of our brain perceive and interpret the world differently, reflecting on the questions of whether both hemispheres should be accepted as equally valid and if multiple approaches, such as science, reason, and intuition, should be relied upon in gaining knowledge. He argues against the simplistic idea that science and reason are associated with the left hemisphere and intuition with the right hemisphere instead suggesting that each hemisphere contributes to each approach in a distinct manner. The book also references an Iroquois legend that symbolizes the struggle between good and evil, memory and forgetfulness, and the dual nature of human minds, highlighting the importance of our choices and the consequences they can have on our perception of reality.
The author refers to various philosophical ideas and mythological stories that highlight the dynamic exchange between opposing forces and their ability to give rise to something new and harmonious. The tension between opposites, such as good and evil, or male and female, is essential for generative vitality and the creation of beauty. He also mentions the importance of simultaneity in existence, where seemingly exclusive pairings coexist and complement each other. The concept of nothing is explored, emphasizing its active and generative nature. Overall, the recognition and acceptance of opposites are crucial for a deeper understanding of the world and the creative process. McGilchrist mentions various philosophical and theological perspectives on this topic, including the concept of coincidentia oppositorum, which suggests that opposites can fall together and form a new image. He also discusses the dangers of extremism and the importance of recognizing opposing truths. Emphasizing the need for balance and integration, citing examples such as the integration of the left and right hemispheres of the brain and the synthesis of wisdom and understanding in the Kabbalah. McGilchrist highlights the cyclical nature of unity and division, explaining that when one goes too far in a certain direction, they end up with the opposite. This principle applies to physical and mental experiences. The phenomenon of hormesis is discussed, where substances or processes that are damaging at high levels can have beneficial effects at lower levels. Examples include low radiation exposure stimulating DNA repair and low doses of toxic chemicals promoting growth. He also emphasizes the importance of embracing opposites simultaneously, such as the need for both restriction and openness, freedom and constraint. Sometimes, the worse things get, the better they become, as certain actions or events that may appear negative can lead to positive outcomes in the long run. Enantiodromia is apparent in nature and suggests that suffering and resistance are essential for growth and consciousness. The creative aspect of resistance is explored through examples such as William James' distinction between the once-born and twice-born individuals who achieve happiness through enduring misery. McGilchrist also emphasizes the importance of balancing opposites, such as chaos and rigidity, stasis and flow, and division and union, in order to create harmony and meaning in life. The asymmetry between these forces is highlighted, with the need for ultimate unity rather than division. There's harmony between sameness and difference in various realms, including music, poetry, physics, biology, and philosophy. The writer emphasizes the importance of balancing sameness and difference in order to create a harmonious and creative whole. Uniqueness is essential, but it also requires a recognition of the general patterns that exist. He further discusses the relationship between identity and uniqueness, as well as the role of the right hemisphere in maintaining a sense of individuality. The paradoxical nature of the one and the many, where uniqueness is dependent on the understanding of sameness and difference. We often focus on the general categories and patterns that give shape to the world, but as adults, we need to make an effort to recover the uniqueness of what we contemplate. The author also touches on the concept of essence and how it has a double life. It makes us who we are as individuals, but it also places us in a general category. Finding the right level where the richest patterns of uniqueness and generalization are revealed. The concept of individuality and its relation to love and generalization is discussed. McGilchrist emphasizes the importance of loving individuals rather than generalities or concepts like womanhood or manhood. Generalization and the drive to make things equal turns them into means for our own purposes, according to Nietzsche. This process of generalization is a characteristic of left hemisphere cognition and is rooted in the will to power. He also highlights the significance of uniqueness and the particularity of individuals. The essence, value, and fulfillment of anything lie in its unrepeatable thisness, and general principles are less appropriate in a universe that emphasizes multiplicity and individuation. The right hemisphere's sensitivity to context and the need for insight into particular situations is contrasted with the left hemisphere's tendency to apply general rules. The process of actualization involves the conversion of potential into concrete individual elements, which in turn leads to diverse manifestations. McGilchrist also explores the interplay between actuality and potentiality, and how they mutually influence each other. The tendency of the world, especially the living world, is towards pluralism, difference, and particularity. He further delves into the differentiation within the central nervous system, 
highlighting the importance of both unity and multiplicity, and touches on the ongoing debate between neurological lumpers and splitters and emphasizes the need to embrace both perspectives. Categorization is necessary for understanding and navigating the world, but that the left hemisphere tends to focus on rigid categories and overlooks the unique qualities of individual cases. In contrast, the right hemisphere categorizes based on family resemblances and recognizes the uniqueness of each case. The author also discusses the importance of familiarity and how the right hemisphere is more engaged with new and fresh experiences, while the left hemisphere is more concerned with routine and familiarity. Emphasizing the limitations of language in expressing uniqueness and the need for poetry to capture profound and personal experiences. Left hemisphere, which tends to analyze objects into their constituent parts and categorize them, and the right hemisphere, which focuses on perceiving objects as unique and whole entities. The book provides examples of individuals with right hemisphere damage who struggle to recognize faces, places, and objects that they were previously familiar with. These individuals rely on analyzing specific features or resort to categorizing objects based on general characteristics. This suggests that the right hemisphere plays a crucial role in perceiving and appreciating the uniqueness and individuality of objects and experiences. Thank you so much for watching this video. Your support means the world to us. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. We look forward to reconnecting with you in the next video for the third part of the summary.